I'd like to thank the Chief Rabbi for coming through. I'm very looking forward to it. We're all in inspiration, especially in preparation for a Yonkov. Thank you, Rabbi Bukas. It's such a, a special joy to be here and to pay tribute to you and your Rebbitson on the wonderful work that you're doing here at Waverley. I know that you're touching the lives of uh, so many of this congregation. And of course, for me to, to be at Waverley is, uh, is always such a, a joy and a pleasure. It brings back so many memories. Um, having been here at a time as the, the rabbi of the Beit Yisrael Minyan on this campus and it was uh, such a special time for me and for my family. Waverly Shul is so important to the continued flourishing of the Johannesburg Jewish community and uh, it is such an important congregation and you know I'm sure everyone who drives past the, the shul can see the construction and uh, I love building because it's a symbol of confidence in the future. It says that this is a shul that is not content just to hold on to its numbers but this is a shul that really wants to grow and to develop and especially when one looks at where we've all been through such a difficult two years and emerging now completely from COVID that is such an important sign because what we need the spirit that we need in our community is the spirit which is contained in this congregation which says now is the time to grow and that's uh, that's something which is truly special the th there's a concept of inheritance everybody knows the concept of inheritance that parents who pass away hand down their property to their children. That, that concept of inheritance is, uh, is well known in the world of law and society and culture. Is there a concept as well, not just of a financial inheritance, but a spiritual inheritance? And what does it really mean to be a Jew? Are you born a Jew or do you choose it? And of course, in, in, a, in a really fundamental sense, you're born a Jew. We know a person is Jewish by definition of having born being born to a Jewish mother, that, so you, you are born into it. And in that sense, we inherit our Jewish identity and, um, and our Jewish values. It's something that we are born into, so it's like an inheritance. It's a spiritual inheritance, like a financial inheritance, in that sense that it comes automatically with birth. And in fact, that is conveyed by one of the most famous verses in the Torah. And I say it's famous because actually this is a verse which... Um, which is the, the very first verse that a child learns when they begin to speak. The, 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 the Talmud teaches us that as a child begins to, to learn to speak, we need to start to, to teach a child Torah. And uh, one of the very first verses, famous, famous verse, is Torah tziva lanu Moshe, morasha kihilat Yaakov. The Torah was commanded to us through Moshe, Morasha kihilat Yaakov, and then it uses this word Morasha, an inheritance to the congregation of Jacob. Morasha, an inheritance. So the Torah is called an inheritance. So we, and why is it called an inheritance? Because it comes to us through birth. So that's on, that's on one level. However, that's not, that's not the final picture because there's an amazing Mishnah in Pirkei Avot in chapter 2, Mishnah 17. And the Mishnah says, Prepare yourself to learn Torah because it is not an inheritance. So, so here we have, in a sense, a contradiction, an apparent contradiction between what the, the Chumash is telling us from this famous verse describing Judaism as a Morashan inheritance and the Mishnah coming and saying, no, it's not. That, that's not just a textual tension here between two texts. It goes to the very heart of what does it mean to be a Jew. Is it something we're born into or not? Is it a real inheritance or is it not? What, what is its very nature? The clue to this is actually the distinction between two words here. There is the word morasha and yerusha. The chumash, when the Torah says that it is morasha kilat Yaakov, it is the inheritance of the congregation, of the whole community of Jacob, that is morasha. That's, that's a different word from yerusha. Now let's try and understand what is the meaning of this word morasha. And why did the Torah use the word morasha and not the word yerusha? It sounds like technicalities in Hebrew. But when we, we get to the bottom of this, we'll actually discover the essence of what it means to be a Jew and the essence of this festival of Shavuot that, that we're about to celebrate. And the clue to this, the clue to this word morasha, if we want to get to the bottom of it, the clue, according to the Balaturim and the Maharam in their commentaries on the Chumash, is actually 
the other occasion where this word morasha appears, and that is in Pashat Va'era, okay, which is in the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus, chapter 6, verse 8. And God says, el ha'aretz asher nasati et yadi la tedota. I will bring you to the land that I have sworn to, to give to you. That, uh, that is la'avraham li'itzach ko Yaakov, And I will give it to you morasha. Again, as an inheritance. So there you have the word morasha as well, referring to the land of Israel. So we have the, the word, the Torah uses the word morasha in two places. One in reference to the Torah, and this in reference to the land of Israel. And the, the Balaturim and the Maram say, why the connection? Because <clears throat> the reference to Morasha in the context of the land of Israel is teaching you about what it means when it talks about the Torah. Because when it's talking about Morasha in the context of the land of Israel, that was not an inheritance that came automatically and easily. That was an inheritance that we had to put in effort for, we had a risk for, we had a fight for. When Joshua takes over from Moses and he leads the people into the land of Israel, there was a battle on their hands. It was the promised land that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but there were nations in the land, and they had to enter it, and there were wars. They did offer for peace. In fact, um, our sages and our sources teach us that God commanded them to, to, to offer peace and to try to make peace deals with the nations who were there, who rejected all of their overtures for peace. So in the end, they had to fight for it. But they, it did not come easily. Inheritance is automatically. When, when a parent passes away, that inheritance comes directly to the inheritance. And actually, in, in Jewish law, in halakha, it's even more automatic than in, in secular law. Because in secular law, when a person passes away, the property goes into the estate. And then the inheritors have to take it from the estate. In halakha, it goes directly from the parents to the children. It's automatic. No effort. It just happens by itself. And so... What, uh, what, what, what they teach us, the Balaturim and the Maram say, that in actual fact, this is teaching us the importance of the word morasha, that in the context of the Torah, what it means is something that we're going to have to put in effort for. And that's actually what the Mishnah Pirkavot is really saying. It says, prepare yourself for this. Hat Kain, prepare yourself in order to learn Torah. Sheina Yerushalach. It's not a Yerusha. It's not just an inheritance. This is a morasha. It's a heritage. It's something, it is a heritage, it is something which you need to, to work for, and you need to choose it, and it's, and it's something that is not going to come automatically to you. And in that sense, and this is something which the commentators on that Mishnah point out, the Tiferet Yisrael, for example, says on, on the Mishnah, when it says, Eini Yerushalach, it's not your inheritance. When it's, talking about, when it's talking about the nation of Israel, it is indeed a guarantee that Am Yisrael, the Jewish people, will always have the Torah and it will pass from generation to generation. In fact, Haksava HaKabol in his commentary here on the Chumash says that Morasha means it's forever, it's eternal. There's a guarantee that, the, that there'll always be Torah with the Jewish people. It is part of our very essence and the, the, the identity of who we are. In fact, Rav Sadia Gaon says when he's making the prediction in, uh, in, in, in around about the year 8900, and he's talking about the future of the Jewish people. He's saying there will always be a Jewish people because we are carrying the Torah in this world. And Hashem has guaranteed that the Torah will be in this world. And therefore, we, we are guaranteed of a future. There will always be a Jewish people and there will always be Torah with, with Am Yisrael, with the Jewish people. But as an individuals, says the Tiferes Israel, there an individual has to make the act of choice to say, I want to be part of the Jewish people and I want a part of the Torah. And if I choose it, I will have it. And if I don't choose it, I can choose to abandon it and then walk away from it and walk away from the Jewish people as, as has occurred on numerous occasions with, with individuals throughout our history. And individuals may step aside and say they want to abandon it but, but as a nation, it will always be there, but each individual has to make a choice. Am I in or am I out? Is this something that I want for myself or is it not? It is not a Yerusha. It's not an inheritance. It's a Morasha. It's a heritage, which means we have to claim it. We have to own it. We have to choose it and we have to put effort into ensuring it. And that's essentially what happened on Shavuot. Because when God came to the Jewish people, he came to the Jewish people, he didn't force us, 
He came to the Jewish people and he said, here is the Torah, we had to make a choice. Nasev and Ishma, it's true, the Gemara says that the, uh, that the occasion was so overwhelming, and this is how the Maral interprets the Gemara, the occasion was so overwhelming that the people felt tremendous pressure and a sense of inspiration to be able to accept it and to say, listen, this is something that we want, but ultimately they had to say, Nasev and Ishma, we want this, we accept it, they made a choice. Shavuot is the anniversary not only of Hashem giving us the Torah, but the anniversary of Amis of the Jewish people saying, Nasev and Ishma, we will accept it. So there is choice. And each person has to make a choice. This is where Hashem gave us. He gave us the Torah. The Rambam says in Hilchot Shuvah that one of the foundation principles of the entire Torah is the concept of Bechirach of Shit, that we choose. And we have to make that choice. That's what it means. It is a morasha. It is a heritage which we choose, not a Yerusha which comes to us automatically as an inheritance. We have to make that choice. And it occurred to me, if this is the theme of Shavuot, it would make perfect sense why we read Megillat Rut on Shavuot, the book of Ruth. We read on Shavuot because what is really the book of Ruth about? It is about the contrast between two individuals, one who was born into the system and abandoned it, and one who was born outside and chose it. Elimelech was born into the system. He was royalty. He was aristocracy. He was uh, the, the, the leadership of the Jewish people. And when there was a famine in the land and he was wealthy and he had the opportunity to support and to give tzedakah, he ran away from the mitzvah of tzedakah, of charity. He ran away from the land of Israel. He ran away from his calling and his mission. He left Israel and went to live in Moab. And he gave up his Jewish heritage and his, his sons married out of the faith, they left behind the people and they left behind Jewish values. And then Ruth returns. She is, she is um, born into royalty in Moab and she gives up the privilege of the royalty in order to accept the privilege of being a Jew and she converts and she chooses it. In fact, many of the laws of conversion are learned from that famous speech that Ruth gives to her, to her mother-in-law, Naomi, wherever you go, I will go, your people will be my people. Those are where, where many of the laws of conversion. So you have this contrast between Elimelech, who, uh, who is born into it but gives it up, and Ruth, who is not born into it and chooses it. And that is what Shavuot is about. It is about actively saying, this is our morasha. This is our heritage. Now we are claiming it. Now we are choosing it. And that's perhaps why the book of Ruth is read. And it's also very interesting that the, the Talmud learns many of the laws of conversion from what happened at Mount Sinai when we received the Torah. Because it's true, we, we, we appeared at the foot of Mount Sinai as the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with tremendous with tremendous lineage, and we are their children, but ultimately we had to choose it. We had to say, Nasev and Ishma. We had to go through that process of conversion. We had to say, this is indeed, this is indeed what we want. And from that concept of choice takes us to the next stage of it, which is choice comes with something else, and that is effort. Because one step is, I choose it. The second step is the effort of saying this is something that I have to work for. And here, if you look carefully in the language of the Mishnah, you will see it. The Mishnah says, that same Mishnah we were quoting before, Prepare yourself to learn Torah. Prepare yourself before you can receive the wisdom of Hashem, because it is not just an automatic inheritance. What does it mean to prepare yourself? So Rabbeinu Yonah says, prepare yourself means work on your character, your midas. Work, become a mensch, refine yourself to be able to receive it because the, the Hashem's Torah is so great, it is filled with the, with the divine wisdom. We have to raise ourselves to make ourselves worthy of it. It's not just something, first, it's, firstly, it's not automatic, we have to choose it. But secondly, even after choosing it, we have to put effort into to make ourselves worthy of it. And not only the effort of working on character, but the effort of working on the mitzvahs and saying, and saying this is something that we, we, will, we are prepared to and that we want to and that we are inspired to really invest time and energy in. And to say this is not a product that we consume, but it is a way of life that can transform us and that gives us the opportunity to achieve greatness. And, and, and in a certain way, 
This is looking at things from a completely different perspective because in, in a culture of consumerism, there is a culture which says a product has to be made as easy as possible for the consumer. And any, any friction in the transaction, in the, um, in, in, in the enjoyment of the product, any friction is going to lead to less consumers. It's just a simple law of economics. If the price is higher, then fewer people are going to buy it. If the, if the way to purchase it is, requires more effort, if you, if you have to leave your home to go and buy it, or you can just click to buy it, or if it's two clicks or three clicks, or if the product requires you to assemble it, or it's just going to arrive ready-made, and who's going to assemble it? Every, every bit of effort required to enjoy the product is going to mean there are less consumers for it. It's just a simple law of economics. But Torah is not a product. It is the divine formula to live the best life that we can possibly live. It is the divine formula for living with meaning and purpose. It is the divine formula for true and lasting happiness. It is the divine formula to create ourselves into people of greatness, to refine our character, to nurture our relationships. It is the divine formula to make us people of ethics and character. It's the divine formula to make us people of spirituality, connected to our loved ones, connected to our friends, connected to God. It is the divine formula for how to be a giver rather than a taker. It is the divine formula to be a person who contributes and makes a difference. But with this divine formula comes one thing, and that is effort. And we need to, therefore, as we prepare for Shavuot, flip the way that we look at it. Instead of saying this is a product to be consumed and therefore the less effort the better, rather this is a way to become a better person. This is a way to do something which is really worthy and really meaningful. And do we not know the wisdom of that other teaching in Pirkavot, which is right at the end of chapter 5, famously says Lefum Tsar Agra in accordance with the effort is the reward. And we know that. The most worthwhile things in life come with effort. That is when we get the real joy. That is when we get the real joy, when we really are prepared to invest. The relationships that we put effort and energy and love and are prepared to sacrifice for and to give. What is a marriage that is not built on giving and a sense of commitment to the other, looking to help, looking to contribute? What is parenting? The real joy of building family, the real joy of relationships, the real joy of contributing to community, the real joy of helping another, the real joy of connecting to Hashem, of connecting to ourselves and the people around us. The real joy comes not from a minute or two of, of sustained effort. It is a lifetime. And the more that we put in, the more that we have a deep sense of satisfaction. Products that we consume can fill us for a moment. But when that experience of the pleasure of that product is over, it is gone. It is gone and disappears. Whether it is a product which is a food product, a clothing product, whatever, whatever product it is, it gives us that moment of, of pleasure, that moment of excitement, and then it dissipates into the ether. And we're then looking for the next one and the next one and the next one. And whereas the, the things that we have to give ourselves to, that we have to really pour in the effort, that is where we have the deepest sense of satisfaction from life. And that is the message of the Torah, which says, Hat Cain, prepare yourself. This is not going to come easily. If you want to learn Torah, you're going to have to put in effort. If you want to... To, to, to keep Shabbos, then that's going to require preparation. It's going to require, but when you do, wow, that's going to bring the deepest sense of joy and togetherness in your family. When, 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 you, when you come to Shul and you're going to daven, not going to sit as a spectator to listen to the beautiful music, but going to say, I want to actually be part of this. It's going to take a little bit more effort, but if I put myself into it and I make the effort and I try and understand the prayer, that's when it's going to really come alive. And in relationships, if I'm looking for saying, what can I get out of it, then ultimately it's going to be an empty relationship. If I go into the relationship saying, what can I give to it? How much can I do 
for my spouse, for my children, for my parents? What can I do for my community? What can I do for others? How can I make a real difference? How can I give charity? How can I give a compliment? How can I comfort the mourners and, uh, and visit the sick? How can I, I bring healing and comfort and love into the world? When I ask those questions. When we ask those questions, that's when we feel the real sense of joy. And if you think about the book of Ruth, ask yourself this question. Who ultimately led the most meaningful life? Was it Elimelech who pursued his own self-centered approach to life where he was looking to see what he could take out of it, what he could, see, could consume from the world? Or was it Ruth who said, wherever you go, I will go. And your God will be my God and I'm going to, I'm going to help you and I'm going to make a difference. And, and she then created a tremendous family from her came King David she became part of history and, uh, and and that's the ultimate irony of the book of Ruth is that Elimelech who who was looking out for himself was the one who lost ultimately and Ruth who was prepared to give she was the one who ultimately gained and that is what it means morasha it's not an inheritance it's not just something that arrives and this lands and 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 become it's not just something that arrives and just appears it is something that we have to fight for and that also means this the torah is accessible to everybody the Vilna Gaon makes this point on this Mishnah. It is not an inheritance. The Vilna Gaon says, Moses, he wanted his son Gershom to take over from him. But the Torah is not an inheritance. And who was the person who put in all the effort? Joshua. He was the one that our sages teach us was, was uh, preparing the study hall. He was the one who, who gave himself with total devotion. He... He, he took the initiative, and then he became the leader after Moses. And um, the, the, the Vilna Gaon also quotes from the Gomorrah in Yuma that says, it is the crown of Torah which is available to everybody. The crown of priesthood of the kahuna you have to be born into. The crown of kingship, which the Talmud talks about, which is the crown of royalty you have to be born into. But the crown of Torah, that is accessible to everybody. It is non-elitist. It belongs to all. Any Jew who wants it, it is, there, it is there for the taking. That's what it means. It's not an inheritance. It's a morasha. It's a heritage. But we have to go and claim it. And if you see that theme, in the same way that you see in the book of Ruth, the theme of Ruth versus Elimelech, you see that throughout the Chumash. Yitzchak, um, Yitzchak was, the, was the younger brother. And he was the one, instead of Yishmael, who continued the heritage of Abraham. And Yaakov, who was the younger brother to Esau, he was the one. It didn't go in, in order of inheritance. It didn't go in hierarchy of, uh, of position and birth. It went by merit. It went by those who said, this is something that I want. It was Yosef versus his brothers. Each we see this time and time again in the Torah how it is the initiative. It was that, and that's part of the message of the book of Ruth. It's not an inheritance. It means it's in our hands, which means it's open to everybody, which means that anybody can access it, but there has to be the will. It's not something that comes automatic by birth. It's something that we have to give ourselves to. And this is so fascinating if you think that the source of the word morasha. Because we said, this is where we started our discussion this evening, is to say, Torah tzivalanu Moshe, morasha kihilat Yaakov. It is the heritage of the, the, the community. Morasha kihilat Yaakov, the, the heritage of the community of Jacob. What does it mean, morasha? So remember we said it comes from the verse describing the land of Israel as a morasha. Also a heritage, not an inheritance. And... We learned from there, the Balaturim said that in the same way the land of Israel, they required effort. But I think we can learn in the other direction as well. And the Balaturim makes this point that the land of Israel comes to us through the merit of the Torah. It, we, the, the, we learn in both directions between these two words, which means that our relationship, the Jewish people's relationship to the land of Israel is not like any other nation. It is a relationship which is based on a spiritual heritage. And that spiritual heritage is connected to the values of the Torah. And therefore, it is something that one has to embrace the values in order to understand it. It's not a land which is inherited. It is a land which is claimed. It is a land which is won. It is a land 
where one embraces the vision for which God gave it, which was to be a platform for the expression of the values of what it means to be a Jew. And again, we come back to the book of Ruth. Think about it. Eli Melech, who was born into all of this, he left the land of Israel because it was a time of famine. And he was wealthy and people wanted charity from him and he didn't want to give it. He turned his back on Jewish values because he, he didn't have the values of compassion, of generosity. And therefore he couldn't stay in the land because he didn't appreciate it. For him it was just another place. And if, and, and if, if times are tough and you're under pressure from, from the poor, then, then go to where you can preserve your wealth. Because for him the land was just a place. It wasn't the place of values. And Ruth went in the other direction. She was born in Moab and she made Aliyah. She went to Israel because she was searching, as she says to her mother-in-law, your God will be my God. She was searching for Hashem. She left behind the idolatry of Moab and she was searching for God and she was searching for justice and for connection and for spirituality and for values. That is what she was searching for. And, and her quest then to arrive in the land of Israel was bound up with that. And, and that comes to the understanding of what Jewish identity is. Jewish identity is bound up with morasha. We began our discussion saying, well, is it something one is born into or not? We're born into it, but then you have to choose it. We're born in, but then you must choose it. And that choice means an active decision. This is what I want. I'm in. And more than that, that choice has to be made real with a sense of effort. This is what I want, and I'm prepared to invest effort because this is meaningful. It is special. It is incredibly rewarding to give myself fully to it. And then it's an embrace of Jewish identity, which is about the Torah values, which is what Shavuot is ultimately about. Because what is Shavuot about? It is about saying that as Amis of the Jewish people, we were born, where were we born as a nation? We were born at the foot of a mountain. We were born at the foot of Mount Sinai. What we, we were not born in a land. The only nation in the world not born in a land. Because a, the, the way that a nation is formed, you're in a land, and there's a certain geography, politics, environment, socioeconomic circumstances that forms and molds a nation. We were born at the foot of Mount Sinai to be given a mission by God that we celebrate, the anniversary of which we celebrate on Shavuot. We become a nation because Hashem gives us His values. Then we bring those values to the land, to Eretz Yisrael. We bring the Morasha, the heritage of the Torah and Hashem's values, and we bring that to the Morasha, to the heritage of the land of Israel. And, and that becomes a continuation of the Jewish mission. And so there, there, there is the profound and real sense that on Shavuot we are celebrating the anniversary of the birth of the Jewish people, which is at the foot of the mountain, because our defining essence is the values of the Torah that God gave us when, he, when we first heard those, the Ten Commandments at the mountain, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am the Lord your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt. Here is my Shabbos, honor parents, respect one another, it was, an, it was the birth of a people through the divine values of the Torah. And yet we have to receive those values, but choose them. To say, as Hashem says, I place before you, I place before you these two paths. Therefore, choose life and choose blessing, because that is the path of the Torah, because we have the choice. So we make the choice. We claim our heritage, our morasha, because it's not a Yerusha, it's not just an automatic inheritance. We have to claim it, we have to put in the effort, and that is what we celebrate on Shavuot. And finally this, the Ksava Kabbalah says the word morasha has one other dimension, and that is to give it over to the next generation. Yerusha is what I receive. Morasha is what I give over. And the, the, the heart and soul of what it means to be a Jew is not only to choose these values, to receive these values, but it is also to transmit them to the next generation, to say, this is not just for me. There is a future. There has to be a future. There is a morasha. I'm going to be morish. I'm going to hand this on. But friends, the only way that we can hand this on to the next generation is if we truly embrace the fact that to be a Jew is not just to be born. That's just the beginning. To be a Jew is to choose it, to say, I want this. I'm inspired by the values that Hashem has given us. 
This is the way that I want to live. This is the way of meaning and purpose. This is the way of happiness. This is the way of doing something which is eternal and truly worthwhile. And when I choose that for myself, and when I'm prepared to put in that effort, then I will hand it over. But if I say to, to, to my children and to my grandchildren, this is just an accident of birth, this is just an inheritance that just came automatically, then they're going to say, but, but then why must I continue it? In order to transmit it to the next generation, we have to say, we, in order to transmit it to the next generation, we have to say, I choose this, I own it, I claim my heritage, I want it, I celebrate my heritage, I, I own it, I invest in it, I care about it. I'm going to do everything in my power to make it something which is inspiring and beautiful, which it is because it comes from Hashem. And when we live like that, then this morasha, this heritage, this spiritual heritage becomes ours, but it also becomes the morasha, that which we hand on to the next generation. And Shavuot is the festival that we celebrate all of this. We celebrate our heritage, we own it, and uh, we give thanks to Hashem, and we recommit ourselves to say, this is what I choose, this is what I want, and let's go forward together to the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>